Okay, let me start by asking you a question. Raise your hand if you believe, and I mean truly believe, that enterprise architecture can have a massive change and impact, positive impact on organisations. Does. 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 So let me turn to the second question then. Raise your hand again. If not only you believe that enterprise architecture could have a massive impact on organization, but you are passionate to make sure that each and every engagement that you get involved with ends in a positive result. And say I. This is the last session of the day. Let's go with the band. So Maybe you come from a place where actually going to a boardroom scares you. You're worried about what they're going to be thinking. Are they going to be judging you? Have you got the right information in front of you? Can you actually convince them that you've got the right path that they should follow? Perhaps you find actually that people just don't listen to you. And you find that you, you're lacking influence and you can't build those consensus that you need to be able to make the change happen. To be able to see through at the end exactly what you know needs to happen. Potentially, you're in a place where people groan when they see you. You see it as a problem, they're not seen as an enabler. They may even call you things like the treacle truck driver or the waffle lord. <laughs> <laughs> so, just picture this. You're actually in a position where you don't, you're not afraid of them to the because you know exactly how you're going to talk to everybody. You can pick out the exact arguments that you need to and present them really well. Not only that, but imagine if people no longer groan when they see you, but hang on your every word because they know what you are delivering is gold I'm Just picture this you can sit back and relax because you've got confidence that you know against that. So, if you're in a position where you have all these problems, where you, you've been called the waffle bot, but really you'll be seen as the digital driver, something's got to change, hasn't it? And for that, you need to change your mindset. And the mindset change that we're talking about today is all around how you approach enterprise architecture in the boardroom. Now, what do I mean by enterprise architecture in the boardroom? So, enterprise architecture in the boardroom, for me, is all around discussing all those fabulous models and artifacts and methodologies and taking the essence of that information that we've gathered, all that due diligence, all that hard works. You guys work hard, right? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> oh, come on, guys. I know it's the final session. Let's get some energy. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. We work hard to try and make sure every single engagement works well. That's what it's about. It's about being able to take those specific items, those bits, those salient points that you need to have either some direction or a driver or something where you need to highlight and you need a decision to be made and get them to make that decision. It gets them to concentrate on that one singular thing you need to Because, let's face it, we're all facing the same challenges today. And I think every single lecture I've spoken to listen to today has had the same thing. And that is, we have to do less with more, more with less. Yes or no? Yeah. Probably do the as well. <laughs> we have to do more with less. And what does that really mean? It means fundamentally that our time is incredibly precious, and time is probably the one element that you'll never get back. And that means you have to pick the arguments that you're going to have. You have to pick the elements in the architecture that really make the difference to have those conversations with you. Because surprisingly enough, every other member of that board that you're going to go see has that exact same challenge. That exact same problem. So what I'd like to do is to grab a piece of paper. I'd like to write on that piece of paper three C's. Okay? So you only need a piece of paper. I recommend paper because one of the activities is going to be quite hard off the tablets. Okay. 
And, and, and while you think about that, though, let's. You probably sat there thinking, actually, who am I? Who am I to tell you about how you work with every advantage in the board? Now, if you were with me in October 2006, you sat in a boardroom in a hotel at Russell Square in Russell Hotel. Now, this one's a typical British day. It's not the kind of day where you stick your hand out the window to see what kind of weather it is, and it's all raining, and it's just the temperature that changes. And as you're in that boardroom, it's a beautiful room. I mean, the Russell Hotel, if you've never been in there, it's amazing. It's got beautiful wood paneling, it's got marble chandeliers, really good stonework, marble. And you sat there on the newly formed executive board from a new hospital room. But no idea how this whole thing is going to go. But you've prepared because you're an enterprise architect, right? So you've got all your artifacts ready, you've done your due diligence. And I was sat there, right in my tent, I stood up. And it was in my element. Every single question I could answer. I'll give you an example. So if you please turn to page 437 of my pack, what you'll find over the next 30 pages is a detailed outline of exactly what networking equipment is being left by our divestment engine. Now what you'll certainly see is that we're going to be missing anything to do with the data centre, so obviously we need to build that capability straight in. And not only that, but as the next slide shows, we're also missing the capability of regional distribution centres and head office and the finance function. So obviously we need to be looking at how we can build this in. I mean, you've done that right. I mean, you've done those meetings, you've got all of the data. I mean, data's fabulous, isn't it? Yes or no? Yeah. 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 We all have a data-driven approach, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And that's where I was. I was in this spot. Mark stands because I just don't get it. What is it that you're trying to show that? I don't see how you move our organisation forwards. I don't see where the cost savings are going to come from. And I don't see how are you going to make sure we have no risk. You've just presented us with data. I must admit, I was a bit shocked. I mean, Mark was our CIO, newly appointed. So out of everybody in this entire audience, he was the one person I thought would be on my side. The one person I thought would actually know about this stuff. Where have we gone wrong? I mean, I tried to build a consensus. I mean, you guys are like me, aren't you? You go around, you have those conversations with everybody before the meetings, right? And uh, just to make sure everyone's aware of what's going on. And still, I'm in this position where See, I know. It's challenging me. You know, it's just back to basics. I had six weeks to be able to pull together a new board pack to show them exactly what it was about. And the market bumped to the ground, you know, I couldn't get them on the phone, I tried to practice in the office, even though I had to see them. And everyone else it wasn't really being too helpful. They could tell me what they didn't want, nobody could tell me what they did want. <clears throat> Until about two weeks later, I met up with a gentleman called Phil. Now, Phil is an extraordinary gentleman, the operations director of the new farm of the book. And he said, Look, he says, Martin, it's not about the data. We know you know your stuff. You've been picked because you're an expert in these areas. But what we need to know is what you believe. To show us how that is going to change our organization. Now, it's not easy because I don't know about you, but I've read the Zogar by the old Zachman one and the Pia and all the others, and nowhere does he say anywhere about belief. <laughs> yeah. Which model do you use for that? What process is it? Yeah. I did actually go out with it, I restructured it, and I'm pleased to say that actually on that next occasion I presented only a 10 page board paper. And in that board paper, it showed all my beliefs, how I believed. We would make operation work better. How I believed we could save money, and how I believed we could make sure every single operation went fine. What's the space? If the operation goes wrong, people get a bit irritated. <laughs> um, and that's really where I started from. And I've taken that same process, that same level of trying to find those beliefs, that's the same way of being able to transfer my belief, my knowledge into other people's minds. And that's taken an interesting journey. So I've worked with many different organisations over time in being able to improve the way that they change and the way that they change their organisation. I've also 
been in a position where I have was asked to write for the Digital Leadership Book in 2015, uh, which was published out by British Computer Society. I wrote my own book on digital transformation uh, back in 2015, and that got recognised as an industry award. I'm also an award winning speaker specifically on the subject of change and how to make things happen. But it's not because I'm special. I mean, I'm just a Yorkshire, for God's sake. Yeah? And, but the skills that I've developed and acquired and that I teach my clients are very special. And it's, it's those skills that we're trying to introduce today. So let's go back to the three C's that we've got on our pieces of paper, okay? So, who has got the wrong slide? Ah, oh. So who's got the Irish Sea, Mediterranean Sea, and the North Sea? Anybody? Please raise your hands. Come on, I thought we might have that. <laughs> now, it's because this first C is actually the one thing that most of us probably make this mistake on. Uh, and when you get this wrong, nobody actually understands what's going on. But when you get it right, the magic really happens. Because all of a sudden, you have an understanding. And that C is around communication. Now, when I'm talking about communication, I'm really talking about the language that you use. Because language is really important that you choose what's appropriate to your audience. I have heard it said in the previous lecture uh, from Judy, where she said actually that you won't use enterprise architectural language necessarily when you're talking to a, a normal human being. That's not to say we're not normal human beings, which is extraordinary. Um, and that one won't, I'll not do that one ever again. Um, <laughs> So when you're thinking about how you're, you're structuring language, really think about what it is. Because I've been in boardroom situations where I've had the head of IT argue with the board because the board wants to put an intranet site on the internet, using SharePoint online or something. And he argues with the board because intranet sites are internal. It's the definition of the word intranet, we use an internal network. The problem being is the board don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've got to work out what is it that they mean. And when they're talking about internet, what they're actually saying is we want a portal by which we can share things, we can collaborate. We're seeing our organisation grow beyond our boundaries, and therefore we need to embrace this and work out a way of being able to do whatever. So standing there, and I've done this the head of my team, like your internet site is an interpreter, it's the wrong thing to argue about. Now, I'm sure you guys would never have that kind of would you? Yes, I am. No, that was that one, actually. <laughs> but I'd like to illustrate a point. So with that piece of paper that you've all thrown three seasons, can you all stand up for me? With your piece of paper in hand. Please don't use your laptop. It will destroy it. <laughs> okay. I'll put mine behind the back. Right, I would like you to fold your paper in half. Okay. <laughs> No, you can do it in front of yourself. I just don't want you to this. Okay? Now I'm going to fold it in half again. I want you to tear a corner off it. Yep, it's gone. Okay? Fold it half once I will take that back below. Fold it half once again. And tear another corner off it. Okay. What I'd like to do now is unfold your paper from where it's in the head. And yeah, not in your head. That will work. Okay. What we all noticed, the same instructions for everybody has resulted in different results. Correct? And it's because we you can sit down now. And it's because we all take a, a different initial starting point. Because when you're in that boardroom, every single person who's there has their own worries. They have their own department or their own practice area. They have the challenges that they need to get sort sorted out. Because they're looking for direction as well, yes or no? Yeah. So with me, when I did mine, I folded, I folded mine corner to go on it. You guys might not have done You might have actually taken it and folded it landscape or portrait. Because you've all started from a slight position. And you've got to remember that. So when you are having these conversations, be incredibly clear with the people you're talking to because you never quite know the picture that's being developed in their head. And that's really where the belief comes in. Because you're trying to take that mental image that you've got in your mind and transmit it to yourself. 
So you can see what I'm, I don't see what I'm saying. So you can see what I'm saying. Yes or no? Yeah. And that's really the essence of language, really. So it's nothing special. This is nothing new. But it's something that sometimes I think we can forget. Because we're so deep into the technicalities of what we're doing. Because we are subject matter experts, yes or no? Yes. 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 And therefore, we know every single foundation element of the things that we're dealing with. But it means that we have to be really careful when we to explain to others. So, the next C we're going to deal with is content. And this is, when you get this right, it's a fantastic thing. But when you get it wrong, people will judge you on the wrong things. What do I mean, actually, by being judged on the wrong things? It is the fact that most people, because they don't understand the really technical subjects that we may be presenting, they will look at the paper that you deliver and will judge on things that they do understand, like the font, particularly the spellings, or your grammar might not be brilliant, or you might just use that wrong shade of blue for the corporate colours. Yeah. And that will form their opinion of them. You know, and, and first opinions count, don't they? Because at the end of the day, that's what most of us human beings deal with. This is actually that opinion based. And to then change that person's opinion of the, the facts that you've presented can be really difficult. Now, I have worked with some clients, and, uh, and I've worked with some architecture teams, actually, and, and they're so worried about what they, they're going to present, they do the CYA method. You might remember what the CYA method is. It's the cover your bottom method for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> And the effects of what they do is they produce these 400 page documents just like I've done in the past. I've made these mistakes, is why I can tell you about them. Uh, and you know, they, they do that so they don't have to make a decision. They don't have to have an opinion. They don't have to have their own belief challenged or judged. But by doing so, what they do is they create confusion. As these board members, they're really busy people. I don't know if you've noticed that. But they tend to have their own agendas and things that they do. So they're not going to sit down and read a 400 page paper. I'll tell you how much. You're going to struggle to get them to read a 10 page paper, and most of them will just flip through it to be good at absolute facts. So, you've really got to make sure the elements that you put into your content is absolute gold dust. So, take that um, design method, what's it called? Less is more. Yeah? That's really important to start to think about the content that you're going to present uh, to the board. Which would be in regards to which situation you And that kind of really brings me back to the, the last of the three C's we're going to talk about today. And along with this one, I tend to find it's one of those that most people forget. And what they do is they're so busy dealing with their own task, their own thing they've got to deliver, they actually forget about the bigger picture. But yeah, when you remember the bigger picture, you actually have a massive impact. A massive impact on all of it. And that is context. I just remember in the context that you're there in. Who here has been in a meeting where there's people that are sat in a meeting that do not contribute, that do not ask questions or anything? Raise your hands. I mean, I'm not talking about you guys. You guys contribute, right? You don't answer that question. But, <laughs> but, but the whole point is, you're there for a reason. There is context for you to be in that meeting. You have been invited to sit there because you are an expert. And as such, they're waiting for you to ask questions, because that's what experts do, isn't it? Experts know the right question to ask to be able to get the right answer to be able to give themselves forward. I know it was on old daddy, you know, to ask, so you have to get a good answer, you have to ask a good question. And I think, was it, um, I think it was Picasso who turned around and said, uh, computers, computers are rubbish. They just give you answers. It's the question that drives us. Now, and this is the same thing. You're there with agreement where you, you're being expected to do things. You've already gained their trust. They already like you, know you, and they want you to do a good job. So prove it to them that you can. You don't have to give them the massive board paper or anything because they already know you. If they don't or they're worried about something, don't you worry, they will ask questions. And they can answer very difficult <coughs> questions. And then you can bring out your architecture artifacts. You can bring out your documents and your methodologies and the people that you've had working with you, and your banks of architects and whatever else that's going to need to be able to help them understand this work. But just work from the premise that they do know and they do trust you. So I'm going to challenge you to go away 
you leave this room. And don't be afraid of entering the boardroom. Don't be afraid of speaking up. Don't be afraid of sharing your opinion, your belief, and what your knowledge is of where you're going to move forwards. Because that's what's going to change before life. And if you want to continue to get the same results you're doing today, continue to take the same actions. My final word, you might want to write this down, is the skill of influence is built the skill of influence is changed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that was an excellent uh, high power, high energy way to finish the day, so thank you for that. Are you yeah. a New Yorkshireman? Have you got no shame, man? <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, modest, let's put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? About Yorkshire as well, I'm quite happy. So Yorkshire free? What? <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing about being from Yorkshire is a dishonour. So we taught the Scots how to be frugal, that's all. It doesn't mean we don't know where value is. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, quickly. So uh, what is the best way to bring people along with you to get them to take ownership of any change because people like to stick to their own way of doing things? How do you get people more to get them to embrace the change? That's a fabulous question. If anybody else didn't hear it, it's talking about how do you bring other people along the journey of change and what's the best methods that you can find to do that. Um, the best method I've found, and again this is the way I work, it is to really explain some why. Why are we doing the change? Uh, what is going to be the end result? How is it going to impact them? But you also have to think about it in the, in the wider context because every change has, has more than one facet. So you'll think about it from uh, an organisation point of view, and every organisation does how much it's going to cost us, the change is going to be, how long is it going to take, yada yada yada, how much the benefits for our organisation. But the bits that they don't really talk about, things that you need to think about, talk about with your teams on, is actually, what's in it for me? Because the human mind works in a simple way, that it, the first question it asks is, what's in it for me? You know, it's the fight, flight, threat, or Mate kind of syndrome, you know, you're going to have one of those kind of ideas. So you have to address that. And once you've addressed what's in it for me, how am I going to do it? Is it going to be better, uh, a better quality of work? Is it going to be a better kudos for me? Am I going to be able to use this on my CV? Am I going to see a pay increase? Whatever the benefit is for that person, just highlight what that is. So with any change in any bunch of stakeholders, you can get winners and losers? Yep. How do you sell it to the losers? <sighs> Good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, good question. I don't think I've got a really good way of doing that. I, I think you've got to be honest and frank. Uh, I think it... Well, yeah, being dishonest doesn't work. No, and I'm trying to tart it with the poo sandwich. I'm trying to think how not to me. It doesn't work either. Uh, so I, I think having that very frank conversation, and then I have had to have those on certain occasions uh, where you have to just explain that something might not be working or potentially some uh, department's going to be changed or whatever's going to happen there. Uh, <laughs> Conversation. Just being straight and honest. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I can get away with it. Being a Yorkshire, we're quite good at that, being fine and honest. <laughs> yes? Um, is the challenge I have uh, had is if you don't believe to change yourself, what do you do with that? Um, <laughs> get another role. <laughs> uh, to be frank, that's the only way to do it. I have I personally have exited roles where I don't believe I can make an impact. Um, then I have a very firm belief that I want to work somewhere, work in an organisation, if I can make a change, be that change, make things happen. If you're in somewhere where you can't do that, then you're never going to believe it. If you're the kind of guy that can take money for just saying that, fair enough, but I'm not that kind of guy, then I want to very much in his life and something else to do. So how do you deal with the lukewarm support? The lukewarm support? Yeah, as in talk, talk, talk of change, but don't actually really want to do it. <laughs> A lot of that is, is almost pushing the back to ask them the questions, find out what the challenges are. Um, and it's amazing, in many situations, a lot of people can't support us because they've got their own agenda. Uh, and nine out of ten times, if you can ask the relevant questions that suggest where the change should be going, uh, and make it so they are actually suggesting that change, you'd be surprised at how much that support changes. So it's, it's a lot of it's just the engagement side. 
Excellent. And then that is one. It only remains for me to say, well, thank you for listening to the guest. And again, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you very much.